Brewing was a competitive scene in Auckland. Uh, there had been the Whitsons, now there were the Ehrenfried brothers, and uh, then there were also the, the Davis family, uh, Sir Ernest Davis, as he ultimately became another mayor of Auckland. Uh, they, they were good in, into uh, uh, local government, the, uh, the brewers, so there was quite a bit of competition. Ehrenfried, of course, is, a, is, is Jewish, uh, very devoutly Jewish, so are the Davises. Um, brewing in Auckland had a strong uh, Jewish uh, element to it in the early uh, stages. Aaron Freed was very fond of his youngest sister's family, um, Katharina Myers. <coughs> she had married a Polish Jew by uh, the name of um, uh, Miltzina Myers. Of all of the children, the brightest and the one who was Aaron Freed's favorite was Arthur Myers, Arthur Miltzina Myers. Arthur Myers starts to work for his uncle in Aaron Freed Brothers. Uncle Louis, as he was always known, uh, was very fond of Arthur in particular. And Arthur was a, a, a very polite, uh, well-informed, sensible young fellow with a um, entrepreneurial bent. And he gradually emerges as the uh, key figure in Aaron Freed Brothers, particularly as Uncle Louis's health began to fade a bit. And by the early mid-90s, Arthur Myers, uh, who by this time is only a man in his uh, mid-late twenties, is a substantial figure around Auckland uh, in business circles, but he is really becoming the key figure driving Aaron Freed Brothers which by this time is the biggest of the breweries in Auckland. As Aaron Freed's health failed and or faded, and it was fading from really the early 1890s through until he died early in uh, 1897, he increasingly favoured some kind of partnership with another brewery in Auckland. And the father of Auckland, uh, John Logan Campbell, not yet knighted and not yet mayor of Auckland, um, John Logan Campbell uh, seemed to be the sort of person who would make a good partner. Campbell was significantly older than Louis Ehrenfried uh, and really wanted to get out of the brewing business. He couldn't stand publicans and their wives, he uh, is quoted as uh, saying at one stage and he wanted to uh, get out of things. And uh, just as Ehrenfried is dying in early 1897,
the partnership is patched together with uh, Logan Campbell as the chairman of Campbell and Ehrenfried, as it came to be known, Arthur Myers as the chief executive, and other Myers members of the family, an older brother, Ben, a younger brother, Leo, uh, both worked for the firm as well. So, uh, and on Campbell's side, Alfred Bankart, who was, um, again, a significant fellow and a good friend of Myers's, um, they are the two figures in the firm looking after the uh, inherited interests, if you like, of uh, the now dead Ehrenfried and old uh, Logan Campbell, who is by this time v very ancient, shortly to become mayor uh, of Auckland in 1901. Lager, the great German invention from the 16th century, came to New Zealand in 1900. In fact, Valentine's Day 1900, the Captain Cook Brewery in Newmarket produced the first lager beer. At the time, the Captain Cook was owned and run by a guy called Moss Davis, who was uh, a German Jew, and he was familiar with the lager being produced in Germany and decided to bring it to New Zealand. Moss Davis's lager uh, stunned onlookers at the time because of the crystal clear nature of the beer. Um, until then, a lot of beer was cloudy, unfiltered, and not really a joy to behold, but this crystal clear lager soon grabbed the imagination of the people and became very popular. Why lager took so long to get to New Zealand is because it requires refrigeration to produce it and the technology just wasn't there. Uh, at the turn of the 20th century though it was. Lager, however, was not mass produced in New Zealand until post-war. He decides that uh, he will uh, accept an invitation to stand for the mayoralty in uh, 1905. In those days, the mayoralty had to be elected every year. And so he stands for election four times. He's mayor for only four years. Uh, he goes off to England in 1909, but he is associated with a huge number of major developments in, in Auckland. Um, new water supply system from uh, the Waitakere Ranges with the setting up of the uh, Auckland Destructor down by Victoria Park, the big uh, chimney that still exists there. There's a photo of Arthur Myers peeping out the top of it when it was constructed in about 1906, I think it was. And uh, his final and major achievement was the town hall. Uh, he um, was a key figure in getting the competition underway for um, the design. But it is open and opened in 1911, by which time he's Member of Parliament for Auckland East. And Myers held the seat from 1910 until 1921. He's spending less and less time with the brewery, but he is still managing director of it. Myers also, it should be said, is a, a very significant person during the First World War. He uh, is a member of the national government, which holds office from 1915 uh, through until 1919. Uh, Myers is Minister of Munitions and acts quite a lot as Minister of Finance. And all of this is being done while he's also managing director of uh, Campbell and Ehrenfried. Prohibition virtually started on the beach um, 
in Kororarika, um, the first uh, prohibitionist meeting or the first temperance meeting was in the early days of Kororarika in the early 1830s. And on the other side of the island in Hokianga, a trader and shipbuilder called Thomas MacDonnell uh, unofficially became a prohibitionist because when any, whenever any ship arrived there with alcohol aboard, he used to pour it over the side. Another very interesting thing, I think, in terms of beer drinking in this country, is it certainly says something about New Zealand, that the first poster print, printed in this country was a poster for a temperance society set up uh, to try and banish drinking uh, because it was perceived by at least some members of the society as being a problem. Pioneering countries have always had a problem with drunkenness. The drunkenness in Auckland, I think in the 1870s, or 18, certainly 1850s, was, you know, 15% of people were convicted of drunkenness uh, in, a, in a given year. It was a terrific problem. The urge for prohibition was a sort of an early form of social engineering. There was this hope that if only you could get rid of alcohol, uh, that you could reform men in particular. And there were people who came here to start a new life and a new world in a way. So, and drunkenness was a major problem in England at the time as well. One of the reasons why New Zealand was colonised because England was a lot of they had a lot of unemployment in England, and it was a pretty grim place at that time for working people. So they wanted to start a better place, a nicer place. So they wanted prohibition um, because they thought it would get rid of this evil, and it developed into a, an incredibly zealous moral crusade for a long, long time in New Zealand. The Women's Christian Temperance Union is an international affair that starts really in the 1870s and 80s. The Rechabites was another prohibition group. And um, they tracked around after Louis Ehrenfried and they tracked around after Myers, uh, making their lives uh, difficult. And also another factor was this. That a lot of people, a lot of men came here on their own the preponderance of men over women meant that men spent a lot of time on their own. They were working on farms and isolated areas. The only pleasure they had was to go into town and get smashed. Um, it was, it was a, a strange dichotomy. On the other hand, you had uh, English settlers in places like New Plymouth and Wanganui, Gisborne, uh, who enjoyed a beer. And they had a local brewery and they were moderate drinkers. So it was a strange mixture that developed over the years. So the start of the 20th century was a terrible time if you were a brewer or a drinker because there was a huge push for prohibition. We had a temperance alliance uh, which lobbied government really hard on this subject. There was always a suggestion that in fact it was, a, it was actually made by A.S. Adams, a prohibitionist from Dunedin, that it led to sexual licentiousness. There was always this implication, one of the reasons why barmaids were banned from hotels in the early, very early 20th century. Governments of the day, particularly Seddon's government, and Seddon as Prime Minister 1893 to 1906, Seddon's government, he'd come himself from uh, the West Coast and the, where he's represented mining constituencies. He didn't want to ban liquor. Uh, he'd have uh, lost his seat in a hurry and Seddon agrees to the introduction of the polls that took place every time there was a general election. Thankfully, someone decided that they had to get 60% of the vote for prohibition to carry. Well, of course, the prohibitionists just went spare over that. In fact, the prohibitionists earned 56% of the vote. So more than half the country wanted it, but it wasn't enough to get it over the line in a referendum. By 1919, the, they got it down to 50-50. And actually in 1919, prohibition was voted in in New Zealand. However, what happened was a number of New Zealand troops were stationed overseas in Europe following the, the First World War. And when their postal votes came in, around 40,000 of them, it saved us from having prohibition. Several tens of thousands of New Zealand soldiers who maybe enjoyed English pubs and French cafes uh, to a man almost to a man, voted against prohibition, and that, that carried the day. So we've got a lot to be thankful for for those brave boys.
uh, as prohibition proved in the United States, it wasn't exactly all it was cut out to be. The prohibitionist movement fell away for a whole lot of reasons, a sense of failure, but also the failure of prohibition in the United States. It became quite um, well known here that it wasn't working there. Despite not having prohibition, we did have another evil foisted upon us, and that was six o'clock closing. We ended up with six o'clock closing because, of all things, King George V back in Britain decided, because the war was on, that the royal household would do without alcohol. And David Lloyd George, his Prime Minister at the time, reiterated that, saying, we are fighting Germany and hard drink. In New Zealand, the government, being loyal followers of the mother country, decided that they had to do something as well about drinking too much alcohol in the wartime period. Also introduced at the time, bizarrely, was a minimum purchase of alcohol. And a minimum purchase? Hmm, one beer, two beers? No, a dozen beers. That was the minimum purchase. How that helped efficiency, I don't know. The six o'clock closing came in as a wartime measure in 1917, and you have to remember the mood of New Zealand in 1917 was very sad. Um, out of 1.1 million New Zealanders, 100,000 served overseas in the forces, and the casualties were horrendous. More than 50,000 were either invalided or killed. Um, so it was a very sad country by 1917, and uh, pleasure was not on the, on the agenda. The newly created National Efficiency Board recommended that if people didn't drink so much they would get more work done and that would help the war effort. Now we know we didn't want prohibition, people had voted against it, so the government of the time decided we'll do the next best thing, we'll stop people drinking after 6pm. And so the rule came, pub shut 6pm. Part of the urge during the war for prohibition was the belief that these men, young men, had gone off to Europe, that they would have um, been tempted by liquor um, because of the horrible lives they were leading, and that when they got home, uh, we, and particularly the women folk of the country, should be very careful as to uh, uh, how they were treated, and they had to be brought back into society. And this was the, uh, the sort of argument that was advanced for six o'clock closing. Six o'clock closing was introduced in 1917 and we had it until 1967. 50 years of people leaving work, rushing to the pub, guzzling as much beer as they could put in themselves in an hour before they had to be home. What did it do to our drinking culture? Well, you can only imagine. It was a control measure, really, designed to control men, to uh, let them have their beer, but then firmly close the doors of the pubs at six o'clock, hose them down, and when I say hose them down, that's exactly what they did. The six o'clock swill became quite famous around the world um, for, the, for the men who rushed over to the pub at five o'clock and drank furiously till six o'clock and mostly they were drinking 4% beer, which is hard to get drunk on, but they managed a lot of it. So there was a huge downside to six o'clock closing. It turned out that pouring the blandest possible beer maximised consumption. Six o'clock closing was a curse on this nation.